Welcome to Rising Stars, where Miriam Knight, publisher of New Consciousness Review, interviews exciting new voices in the world of progressive and transformational books, films, and ideas who offer intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us as we celebrate the conscious awakening and explore many expressions of consciousness in action. He is best known for his New York Times number one bestseller, The Book of Awakening. He has published 16 books and recorded 11 audio projects and just published a new expanded edition of Inside the Miracle, Enduring Suffering, Approaching Wholeness that just came out from Sounds True. In it, Mark shares his transformative experience of cancer in his mid-30s and how it changed the way he sees the world and made him a student of all spiritual paths. Although the lessons in his book emerged from his journey through cancer, they're really for anyone struggling with hardship. Mark was part of Oprah Winfrey's The Life You Want Tour in 2014, and he's appeared several times with Oprah on Super Soul Sunday and with Robin Roberts on Good Morning America. And now I'm pleased to welcome him here to New Consciousness Review. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to, to talk with you again. Oh, it's wonderful to have you back. Mark, tell us how this new edition of Inside the Miracle is different from the book that you published 20 years ago. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's it's been a, sounds true that are wonderful, and they offered me this great opportunity. You know, when I was going through this journey, I'm 64, and in my mid 30s is when I went through the heat of my cancer journey and coming close to death and being blessed to be here. And at that time, I wasn't writing to be published. I was writing uh, like a rope, climbing a rope of expression to get into tomorrow. It was part of the medicine that helped me get through that. And originally, I had a small 50-page uh, collection of, of some prose and poetry pieces that back in 94, you know, it, obviously after I got through that, what I went through was not uh, unique. Everyone going through any kind of suffering goes through something similar. So I, I published that um, as an offer of support. And, you know, it sold out with a small press. And all these years later, you know, I've learned that you, you, we're never, I never have gotten over having cancer. Mm -hmm. It turned me inside out. And we'll talk more about this. It's not that, that to deify suffering, it could have been anything. For me, it happened to be that life-threatening situation. But I was dropped into the depth of life, and the transformation keeps happening. So to have a chance to, I, you know, this, this book now gathers almost 30 years of inquiry and learning about suffering and healing and wholeness that have gone on. And that original book, which is enfolded here, is about you know twenty to thirty percent of the book, um, and it's a mix of, as you know, poetry and essays and memoir and uh, of all forms. So to be able to um, re really gather all these years of inquiry into one place is I'm very grateful. Well, even your prose is so poetic. It, it's it's like um, when you read a novel; it's in two D, but Poetry seems to bring additional dimensions to, to the thoughts and images. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I do view, I don't view poetry as form. You know, I, I view, whether it's in lines or stanzas, um, really everything that I write is poetry. And the, you know, if it's in, quote, paragraph form or nonfiction or fiction, and these are just different shaped canvases. And really... To me, poetry is the unexpected utterance of the soul, and it happens whether we write it down or not. <laughs> right. So your, your, one's life actually is kind of poetry in action. Uh, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you initially got this cancerous tumor on your head, and then you had a miraculous remission. And then 
the cancer returned. What what kept you going when when it returned? It must have been so dispiriting. Well, it was, and you know, this was ten months after I had a tumor in my uh, skull bone pressing on my brain, and that vanished, and that was a miracle, an extraordinary, inexplicable event. And within ten months, there was a sister tumor that had grown on a rib in my back, and. And that didn't disappear, and I had to have surgery and chemo, very aggressive chemo, which started to damage and almost killed me, and I had to stop that. And I was, that was my lowest point, was uh, falling into the second, the second tumor because I felt, I felt that I, then I was afraid I might die, and then I was fearful that I had wasted my second chance, had I done something wrong, had I failed in some way. And, you know, it was very humbling and it was very difficult. And and I think, and this is the paradox for anyone, no matter what we're going through, is that um, there was nowhere to go except to stand on the ground of being of where I was, no matter how small that seemed, until it grew more and more solid, until it was larger and larger and I could see where to step, take one step not even going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to give you another example of this, you know, to fast forward a little bit, many years, just about five years ago, I'm fine, but I went through uh, an an ailment uh, that was triggered by the chemo damage I had where my stomach um, uh, stopped emptying. And it took about seven months to heal. And so during this time period, I'm just, this was five, maybe six years ago, three things were happening at the same time. One was I had this ailment which gave me a fear of eating because it was unclear every time you'd eat a little too much, which was never the same, you would be in pain. So I had a fear of the present. At the same time, I was re- reconnecting with my father, who who now is gone a few years. He died at the age of 93. But, you know, we were reconnecting after many years of estrangement. And I was eager to see him, but I was also afraid of what going back into that whole realm would do to my identity. So I had a fear of the past. And within weeks of all of this, I um, was laid off from a job I had. Um, with no notice, and um, and I was sick, and so I didn't know if we'd have health insurance, <laughs> and so now I had a fear of the future. Well, like I ran out of tenses, <laughs> and and it was a very difficult, the most difficult period since having cancer all those years before, and this brings to the home. I share this because of what we were talking about that, you know. To no wisdom on my part, there was nowhere I, I couldn't go forward or even far from where I was or into the future. And I the only place left that was solid, even if it was painful, was the very place I was standing. And when I could stand there, even though maybe I didn't, you know, want to be in the midst of all that, under all that trouble was an inexplicable ground of being. And so there was nowhere to go except to stand like a tree until I started to root in that ground of being. And that, that back then and a few years ago, um, is what helped me uh, see my way through until I could find more and more solid ground. Mm-hmm. You... You speak about learning to trust your own body and to trust your own intuition. I mean, it, it's just so easy to lose that trust when you go through the, the things that you've been going through. Not only trust in our body, but trust in life in general. So how were you able to recover that trust? Well, I think this is, and, and you know, all the things we talk about when we're, you know, and, you know, my story is an example, not an instruction. So we're just comparing notes and 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 going through anything life threatening or dramatic only highlights the same set of choices that we all go through in quote normal days so that's why this is so valuable 
And it's not like someone who might be listening and saying, well, thank God I'm not sick. That has nothing to do with me. No, it does. It does because we all in different degree go through the same archetypal journey. So now to what your question, part of this journey of being human is we have to develop a, a skill of how to restore our trust in life when we lose it. Because part of the journey is we will. We will fall down. You know, I love that medieval monks, when asked how they practiced their faith, would say by falling down and getting up. And so life doesn't change. Life is constant and dynamic. And though it takes many forms, it's unbreakable. And and we, as part of those forms, we fall down, we break open, we suffer. We go into wonder and beauty and, and love. But we will lose sight. Of things, And so how do we restore our trust? I think this ties in with all of the different, you know, practices from all the different traditions, whether they're meditation practices or ritual. So anything that brings us fully back to the present where we are present and hold nothing back will start to restore us and our trust in life. You know, the word appreciate literally means to move toward what is precious. Mm. So when we lose our trust in life, and because everything is precious, you just move toward whatever's near you and give it your full attention. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, we have so many filters as, you know, before we go to a movie, we need to read five reviews, and is it worthwhile? And before we go to the theater, and you know... um, I really laugh at all that because having been through what I've been through, uh, if, if it's theater, it's live theater. <laughs> yes. Even if I don't like the play, it's restorative. Oh, dear. We're speaking with Mark Nepo about his book, Inside the Miracle. We're going to go to break now, but please stay with us for this fascinating conversation. We'll be right back. Free your mind. Expand your soul. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Are you trying to get from point A to point B and need a little advice? Connect with the counselors at Om Times Advisors. Whether you're looking for a life coach or a spiritual intuitive, the advisors participating at advisors.omtimes.com were carefully chosen based on their gifts, skills, and professionalism. Om Times Advisors. Connecting you with the best advisors in the business. Hi, this is Sylvia Henderson, Intuitive Life Coach and Energy Healer. Are you ready to elevate and rise way above your normal? Be sure to listen to my show, Intuitive Transformations, on Own Times Radio, Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. Get the inspiration you need to transform your life. Do you want to be a better communicator? Do you want to better connect with the important people in your life? Do you want to enrich your relationships? If so, join me, Matthew Cooper, on the Positive Control System Show every Wednesday evening at 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Ohm Times Radio. I'll meet you there. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. MarkNepo.com, and there's a sister site, ThreeIntentions.com, all spelled out as one word. And on that site, if you are interested, you can sign up for um, a weekly reflection where a piece of my writing or reflection is sent out uh, once a week. Cool. Very cool. That's M-A-R-K-N-E-P-O, MarkNepo.com. 
Mark, um, you were talking about staying, going into the stillness. When when something overwhelms us like this and we don't know where to turn, uh, the instinct is to go to solitude and go lick our wounds. But your illness taught you a lot about the importance of community. What were these lessons? Well, you know, there, there are many lessons, but just to talk about a few and I believe that that relationship is part of the medicine, whatever it is we're going through, you know, and our challenge, again, in normal times and in difficult times, our challenge is how do we be who we are everywhere and not isolate? You know, I think part of one of the struggles in our age is that, at least in the last generation or in my generation, um, I think there's been a miss understanding that the only way to be yourself is to be by yourself. And that really undermines the entire human spiritual challenge of staying in relationship. I think staying in relationship is the challenge of our age, not staying in abusive relationships or or relationships that are inequitable, but in healthy relationships, whether it's with ourself each other, nature, our community, the mystery. How do we stay in conversation and not hide who we are and also let in life that is not us? And so this is is the ground. And so, you know, when I was ill, I was blessed that people who loved me showed up. And, you know, it stretched all of us because... You know, I had many loved ones who, you know, finally we were in it. And this is very natural. You know, I've been both a patient and a partner and the pain is different, you know. But um, it's very natural that when you are the part, when you're a a partner or a friend or a loved one that's caregiving, you know, you want to show up and you feel like that person who's going through it has enough on their plate. I'm not going to give them, add to it with whatever my frustrations are. But as we live into it longer, you know, my period of, of threatening illness was about three years. Well, then all that fades away and we have to be real with each other. Mm-hmm. And I could see on the faces of the loved ones who were exhausted from driving me to another treatment, to another appointment. But they didn't want to say anything because I was the one with cancer. And I finally said, you know, I, I, I know this is hard for you. It's okay. I know it it doesn't mean you don't love me if you say, you know, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of it too. And when when I could give them permission, then they were able to show all of who they were. And then it was hard to tell who was ill and who was well. Hmm. And that, that was an honesty and a tenderness that began to heal all of us and bonded us at even a deeper level. So I think in ordinary times and normal things, you know, we often are overwhelmed when someone we love or someone we know is going through something and we try without realizing it to problem solve it as a way not to have to feel what they're going through. We mean well. And, you know, I learned this, my wife, Susan, this is, we've been together Mm -hmm. for 20 years, but somewhere midway, um, she was going through something difficult and I was really feeling for her and I was trying to problem solve it. And she stopped and she said, you know, I know you mean well, but you just don't want to feel what I'm going through. And at first I was defensive and then I said, you're right. And it won't happen again. So being, being honest, uh, and, really open is kind of the key to uh, establishing this new level of communication that will make you both feel better. Because the truth of where we are not only shows us what real choices we have, but it also brings up all of our own inner resources. And we often, uh, we often, by trying to stuff or hide or deflect 
what feels difficult or uncomfortable, we cut ourselves off from our own resources. It's like having your hands tied behind your back. <clears throat> so it's, I, it's very important, I feel, in my experience. And, and just because we talk about this, I'm not exempt from it. There are times when I say it's always hard on, on the front side to say, oh, God, do I, how, do, how am I going to admit this? or do? But, but whatever it is, when we are powerless, the greatest power we have is to admit the truth of where we are. And, you know, the Buddhists speak of this as seeing things as they are, which is a very necessary and it's harder than it seems uh, uh, practice to see things as they are, to see events or relationships, you know, to see friends not as... Um, not as I would like them to be. And then I put all this effort into propping up some image of what I'd like them to be, but to see who they are and love them all the same. And it doesn't mean we don't work on relationships. You know, there's a great, in, um, in Shakespeare's sonnets, which there's about 200 some odd sonnets, 250 sonnets. And these, you know, in the Renaissance, sonnets, were like calisthenics for poets. They were, never, <laughs> they were never meant to be published. They were just practice. They were just exercise. But, of course, his were so amazing that they were published after his death, and, and so were so many others. But, but to, to why I bring this up is that Sonnet 130, right in the middle, before that they're all romantic and idealized and about love and beauty and something happened we don't know what but all of a sudden sonnet 130 is if it weren't for the last two lines it's actually cruel he's it's about his love and he says my love her her breath reeks her hair is like wire and she's irritable and he goes through all this thing which you would think oh my god this is cruel it's awful and then at the end, he says, but my love in all of her humanness is more beautiful than all of those that she's afraid to compare herself to. Wow. I never came across that. Yeah, sonnet 130. And so, you know, what he's breaking that idealism and just saying, yeah, you know what? We can work on when we can admit what's true for ourselves and with each other. We can work on things, and then we learn to love people and ourselves for who we are, mm. all of who we are. So many people are coping with the challenges either of dealing with their own disease or dealing with the disease of a loved one that I'm sure many people will resonate with what you're saying. Um, one of the... Thing, coping mechanisms that you discovered for yourself was entering into a state of wonder. Tell us about that. Well, you know, wonder, and let me, let me tell you a quick story, which is the difference between curiosity and wonder, and then I'll answer, speak to that more personally. But there's a little parable about a master who sends an apprentice to meditate and, and sit by a river until he learns all the river has to teach. And he's a very serious student, so he goes to the river and he spends the first half day deciding where's the best place to sit. And finally he sits up just far enough away where he can take in the whole river. And he, he goes into a deep meditation. After three days, all he has is a terrific headache. And then at that moment... A monkey comes along out of nowhere and jumps in the river and is splashing and yapping and howling. And the apprentice cracks. He starts to weep. And he gathers his things and he goes and he, back to his master and he tells him what happened. And his master puts his arm around him and says, Ah, the monkey, li the monkey heard. You just listened. Uh -huh. So that we learn a lot by curiosity, but, but the whole purpose of curiosity, what we learn by observing, the whole purpose is to experience wonder, that is get wet, to get into the river of life, not just watch it. 
not just watch it. So for me, now to go to your question, um, and we all we all move back and forth between this. We all do all the time. So for me, you know, whenever the nature of fear and pain and worry pushes us away, we pull back. That's how it introduces itself to us. The force of it, the suddenness of it is overwhelming and we pull back. And I found that my job or our job, as I understand it, is then to lean forward. When we pull back, lean in. When we fall down, get up. When we go numb, then to wake. And this is the practice that calls the most quiet courage in each of us because when we're present, and we move, as we said earlier, we move toward what is precious, whatever is near to us. We start to restore our trust and we start to feel that we're in the river of life again. And now we start to feel, you know, wonder. And wonder just doesn't appear in beautiful moments. You know, I, I, I mentioned my father's death and, you know, I had a very deep learning moment during during his death, which I write about in, in, in the book. And um, I think I do. <laughs> um, uh, and that is, he was in the hospital, and I'm sure people will recognize this moment. It's not unusual. But there I was alone with him. He was 92, 90, almost 93, and had had several strokes, and, and I was feeding him applesauce. And... Um, and I notice we're almost up to a break. Do you want me to save this story till after the break? Well, if it's going to go longer than the next 30 seconds, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's, well, so st stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> you to you also episodes. told uh, about um, your grandmother when she thought that uh, you had left the room when she was dying. Oh, yeah, when and my dear grandmother, and when she thought that I had left the room, I had looked back to say goodbye. You know, I had said goodbye, and I went to see, look at her one more time, and she was alone. She thought she was alone, and she was staring off into eternity. Yeah. And it was a privileged moment to to just glimpse that, because my heart said, oh, I've got to see her, one more, just one more glimpse. Beautiful. Well, we will be right back with our guest, Mark Nepo, talking about Inside the Miracle. Stay, stay with us, and we'll be back shortly. Your Conscious Lifestyle on Steroids. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Healing Light, on Own Times Radio, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Healing Light... We want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of the Inspired Parenting Radio Show, where every week we bring you empowering information from the diverse fields of conscious parenting, education, neuroscience, consciousness, health, and metaphysics to support you in nurturing the best in your children. So if you're interested in understanding what shapes your children's minds, spirits, and hearts, join me every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and prepare to be inspired.
Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Feed your soul with waves of consciousness on Ohm Times Radio. Sites are marknepo.com and threeintentions.com. Mark, just before the break, you were telling us this story of your father. It's, it's amazing how profoundly we're affected by these um, end-of-life experiences with our parents, no matter what our relationship with them was. Yes, yes. And so this, this moment that I was beginning to speak of was I was alone with my father in the hospital, and, and I was feeding him applesauce. And I felt so tender and bittersweet, and, you know, any moment, and I'm sure many people listening identify with this if they haven't experienced it themselves, that here is a ch- grown child I'm feeding my father, and, um, and how he and my mother fed me when I was little. And so I was so immersed in this moment, fully leaning in and present. You know, there was nothing in the world at that moment for me except I wanted for the spoon to slip in and out of his mouth so easily so it wouldn't hit his teeth or interrupt his breathing. I just became the focus. All of life became that moment. And I began to, to tear and cry. And, and, and to my surprise, when I could inhabit that, what I was given, that moment, what we were given, he and I, completely, all of a sudden, I felt that I was in the moment of every child that ever fed a parent that was dying. And all of a sudden, I was in this wave of compassion. And so this was me. And all of a sudden, there was wonder in the room of all that difficulty and dying and sadness and pain. And all of a sudden, there was wonder coming out. And so it's caused me to start to feel that when when we whatever we're feeling when we can inhabit to the depth of our own personality at that bottom we touch into the well of all spirit and that i think is where resilience starts to show itself from inhabiting ourselves completely and working with what we're given we touch into the company of everyone who ever lived mm. It's a very metaphysical concept, uh, expanding into the, what, what you call, how did you call it, the ground of being? The ground of being. So, it, you know, in, in the way that I'm speaking, an assumption, and let me give voice to it, is that, is that um, in some realm, everything is always living. You know, it's interesting, and Henry Bergson, the great uh, French philosopher, had this image of time as a river. And he said, the river is flowing in all places at once. We're the ones who, wherever we stand, we call it the present. And if we look behind us, we call it the past. And if we look upstream, we call it the future. The river doesn't know those distinctions. The river is moving in all places at once. And so... I think that our heart knows this. Our mind, we like to look at the things behind us and say they're dead and gone. And we like to look ahead of us and say this hasn't yet come into being. But in some other realm, the heart knows that that river of life is, is ongoing everywhere. Not so, just where we are. So do you think uh, there is no contradiction between our notion of being individuals with free will, free choice, um, versus being part of a greater whole, a greater interconnected whole? Well, I think, and this very, this is very keeping and why I like, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a student of all paths, and the thing that I learn and love about Taoism 
which basically Taoism means the way, because it's unnameable, they just say the way, that the larger current of life. And so what Taoism speaks about is that every individual is like a fish in an invisible river of life. And the job of the fish is to find the current and swim with it. So the real purpose of will is to join the larger current of life. And when that fish is swimming with the current of life, then it's a moot question to say, well, how much is it swimming under its own power and how much of it is it the river? We participate with our will, but we don't create everything. We join with the forces that are larger than us. And this now directly pertains to the whole realm of health because in every tradition, they have different names for it, but health is basically defined as when the part is aligned with the whole. And dis-ease or disease is defined as when the part is cut off or separated from the whole because we need to be... so. Our will matters, but not in a controlling, manipulative way, in a um, collaborating, concerting way, in a joining way, mm -hmm. in an orchestration of, of effort with other living things. Hmm. Your... your um cancer, uh, your first cancer, you um, felt that you were able to overcome it through the expression of your will and your, your positivity and so on. And so when you got cancer again, you felt very let down as if you no longer had the, the ability to influence your own um, health and wellness. Um, well, say, how, did, how did you reconcile the two? Well, I would, I would describe it differently, my first experience with cancer. I've never felt that, uh, that I authored some positivity that, that conquered cancer or got me through it. I felt that I was desperate to be here, and so as open as I thought I was, I was now truly open to everything. And so I received help from every direction that I could possibly open myself to. And I was blessed to have people from all paths and all directions um, and all traditions, including, uh, and, you know, scientists and, and a friend who was an atheist um, who, I mean, let's face it, atheists still believe in something. They just believe in nothing as opposed to everything. It's still something larger than them. So, but everyone tried to, with, through kindness, offer me a blessing and uh, some aid. And so I discovered it wasn't through, I was very humbled and I didn't feel, I think positivity is, is overemphasized and overrated as opposed to wholeness and allowing the fullness of our humanity to show itself and to accept help from every direction. And so blessed to still be here, kind of spit out of the, the mouth of the whale of cancer, like, you know, Jonah. Um, I was not and am still not wise enough to know what worked and what didn't. And therefore, I was challenged to believe in everything. And that's why I'm a student of all paths. And that's why I have really spent the last 28 years in all my books and my, my teaching and my inquiry into trying to uh, reveal and bear witness to what I feel is the common center of all paths and lift up the unique gifts of each. Now, yes, when, when I then encountered cancer in the second, within 10 months, the second tumor, I was devastated. I was in despair. I was beyond, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. And this further educated and humbled me into the fact that of how little we have control over. We really have only control over our presence or our absence. And so all I could do was be present. And in fact, even, even prayer was exhausted you know, we, we tend to pray um, when we're 
when we're uh, in trouble, we, we pray and we ask to get out of it. Rather than give me the strength to learn what I'm supposed to learn by working through whatever is before me. And even beyond that, you're exhausted in pain and desperation. You know, I was humbled to just listen, not even ask for anything. And I felt like I finally discovered what prayer is really about. It's just listening. It's receiving. It's not saying, oh, I'm, I'm stuck over here. Get me out of it. Because so much of what matters is beyond what we want or what we think we want or what we think we need. So I, I was worn down um, from uh, to be open to everything and to be open to receive and to trust nothing but my want to stay alive. And for all we're talking here, you know, the mystery is that but for a hiccup of God, um, I would not be here in someone who was next to me, uh, you could be talking to them today. So, you know, it's all very humbling. And, um, and I think that, you know, and so get back to our issue of will, it's we participate by bringing all of our heart and mind and, and spirit to bear through presence wherever we are. And... And by doing that, and no one can do it all the time, so we come in and out of it. By doing that, we start to par- we start to work with all the rest of life, and the rest of life helps us. If there's one way I would characterize your book, it is as a love song to life. It's an absolute celebration of life. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and I think that is really the um, antithesis of trying to control. It's it's flowing with life. It's it's ex- exuberantly experiencing every aspect and celebrating every aspect of life. Yeah. So you know, actually, my my next book, which I'm I'm working on, really explores because it doesn't mean we don't try. It's explore. We'll explore effort and grace because I think effort leads us to grace it readies us for grace so it doesn't mean we don't we don't mm. show up and try it means that we trust our effort more than where we think it's going stay with us and we will be back with our uh, guest mark nepo talking about inside the miracle The cutting edge of conscious radio, OM Times Radio, IOM FM. The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub-Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to in your busy world how do you improve yourself and keep your life going i'm lisa k and my between heaven and earth radio show can transform your life just by listening be uplifted with inspiring topics positive stories and ideas that really work between heaven and earth radio is conscious living for your soul every wednesday at 4 p.m eastern time Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. 
Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Conscious Media for Conscious Minds. OM Times. Parallels between your struggle or any anyone's struggle with a disease like cancer and the greater struggle of our society at this time with the cancer of of terrorism the cancer of fear um what advice do you have for people to how to cope with that to find their center at such a time well, thank you. And I, I don't have an answer, but let me speak to it because, of course, it's been on my heart and mind like everyone with what we're going through. And, and, and let, let, me, let me speak about it this way. You know, um, I had a dear, dear friend and mentor who recently passed away at 102, and he was a doctor and a painter and a child of the Holocaust. And I think his medical frame gave this analogy, and he, he, it's, he spoke about humanity as if every person was a cell in the global body. And he said every human being, every body that's alive has a balance all the time of healthy cells and unhealthy cells. And sometimes the body has diseased cells. But they're all together and they all influence each other. And that when there are diseased cells, the health of the immune system depends on on the continued health of as many of the healthy cells as possible. So this is really helpful to me as we look at we are in an age, and maybe not since World War II with fascism, where we have part of the global body is diseased, part of the global body. And, and what I've learned also from having cancer is that lens has given me that, you know, cancer is a, a cancer cell will is so self-centered that it will eat the whole for it, even though it will never it won't outlive the whole if it destroys the whole it will feed itself at all cost mm -hmm. and these are cancer cells in the global body that for whatever reason which i can't explain i don't know if anybody can the same thing during fascism and at different periods of history that there are certain uh, beings who are so self-centered in feeding their own needs and their own fears that they will eat and destroy whatever's around them. Now, just like with cancer, with a disease, and we have that fear in different degree in our own society, which obviously we're seeing right now. And so, you know, as with any cancer on a, on a, uh, there are three levels of treatment. There's surgery when necessary, and we'll, we're yet to see, you know, uh, World War II was a surgery of sorts, mm -hmm. and uh, we're yet to see how and to what degree mm -hmm. that terrible option has to be pursued. And then there is treatment. And, you know, treatment is uh, every other avenue from diplomacy to compassion to you know red cross to you know the, everything to welcoming refugees to he, well healing each other and feeding each other and then there is prevention which is education you know so that the next generation of cells at the fork of being healthy or diseased become healthy but the other thing that and now let's bring it to a more personal level of how we might participate in all this you know every time we're having a conversation like this and every time we're being uh completely present and living life fully and honestly it's not just never navel gazing it's not just self uh reflection or self rewarding we are strengthening the immune system of the global body so while yes there are things that have to be done on site where the disease is and there are things that have to be done in terms of treatment, in terms of doing, in terms of being, we, we need to stay healthy and other-centered and keep 
the immune system stronger than the pocket of disease. And that goes individually and that goes globally. And how do we do that? I, God knows we're all trying to figure it out. But these are, you know, every, you know, in, in um, Charles Dickens' tale of two cities, you know, the first sentence is it was the best of times and the worst of times. And while that's a great novel, in some ways we could have stopped right there because every generation, every era is the best of times and the worst of times. And we are constantly, we talk about the purpose of will, we are constantly challenged every day. Will we live a life of compassion or of cruelty? And uh, will we exploit and manipulate the life in front of us to suit our needs? And, and most people, you know, I think, I believe, you know, this is an age-old question. Are people basically um, good <laughs> or bad? Yeah. And if they're bad, they need controls and laws and, you know, religions and, and orthodoxy. Or are people basically good and through fear and pain, they are diverted from their better angels? And I obviously am of that camp. I, and all my work is that way. It doesn't deny the presence of evil. It doesn't deny um, the difficulties. But, but most of the time, it's because we're not courageous enough to work through our fear. And so if, if you know, one way that we can help reduce violence in the world, in addition to meeting all these challenges in real time in, in ways of action, Another way that we can help reduce violence in the world is to be devoted to have the courage to face what is ours to face so we don't play out our fear on other living things. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite poems in your book ends with this. My purpose at last, <laughs> to hold nothing back. My goal, to live a thousand years, not in succession, but in every breath. Why did you call this poem for that? What did you mean by that? Well, like, like the Tao, as I mentioned, that just says, names it the way because it can't, you know, and the way in the Jewish tradition, they just, they don't say the word. They never name God because it's ineffable. You know, I was struggling when I wrote that to be alive and it became larger than any word could point to. So I just simply said, for that, just, you know, every way I would try to name it was not enough. And, you know, the lesson from that poem, and I appreciate that, that you, you know, you're drawn to that image, um, is, has been a deep learning that eternity isn't this, we're taught it's a stack of years, one on top of another forever. No, eternity is with the mo like that moment with my father. Eternity is whatever moment of love or suffering or beauty or nature or solitude or community that we live so fully that it opens us to more than just our life. It opens us to the wholeness and unity of life. And we, we don't just grasp it, we feel it. There's a Sanskrit mantra, so hum, which means I am that. And, I, and, and it's identifying oneself with the Tao, with all that is. And I was, I was kind of thinking that that was the direction you were moving Oh, with that. that's beautiful. I didn't know that. That's beautiful. That's exactly it. And that's a demonstration of how not knowing that, my experience led me to that feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's not unique to me. So, in, in summary, what would you hope that readers will take from Inside the Miracle? Oh, you know, my, my hope, and, and all of my work, but especially this book, is that, that this will uh, serve as a companion and uh, that would maybe help, help anyone to introduce themselves to their own wisdom and their own gifts and their own resources and to help people restore their trust in life when it gets shaky. It is so easy to get swept up in fear and to uh, see the testimony of someone who has so overcome, so transcended 
the notion of fear by living life fully is truly inspirational. So I, I really um, want to commend Mark's book, Inside the Miracle to You. It, it's very, very uplifting. Um, you know, Mark, I, I just don't have words for uh, how much I appreciate the work that you do in the world because we are bombarded by fear on every side. And there's no fear greater than the fear of an individual of death. And your book shows that there is a way to transcend it. Give, give our listeners a, a, something to leave with. Well, let me, thank you. That's so kind of you. But let me leave by reading a short, the last poem in the book, which is The Sway of It All. And so I lift my face from the mud, the mud of my past, the mud of history, the thick and ragged bark of how we think everyone but our own darkness is the enemy. I lift my face like a worn planet spinning on itself to get back into the light to say to no one, to everyone, it is an honor to be alive. An honor truly. Well, we have been speaking with Mark Nepo about his book, Inside the Miracle, Enduring Suffering, Approaching Wholeness. His websites are marknepo.com and threeintentions.com. Mark, thank you so much, both for the gift of your book and for being with us today. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank, thank you, Miriam. And I hope you will join us next week when we continue with new rising stars of the new consciousness. In the meantime, visit our website, New Consciousness Review at ncreview.com. And if you want to join us on Facebook, it's NC Review. Many blessings on your journey. Goodbye. <laughs>